If you say that, do you mean this or do you mean that? Because that has always been the best reply of people who have been approached by uh, individuals, whether they came with a philosophy or religion or politics. If they told people what you ought to do is be part of this thing because, and now the words become kind of vague, we do best to tell them, wait, you used this word, that word, tell me, what do you mean when you say that? Now, if the Muslim would insist on that, of telling people, say what you like, but say what you mean, sometimes that is reversed, and people will try to put that back on the Muslim. Don't be fooled by this tactic when it is used unnecessarily. That is, you can be speaking perfectly clearly, and somebody asks you, what do you mean? You want to remind him that you have been speaking clearly. In other words, he'll try to make work for you where no work exists. I just had that happen in uh, Newcastle just a few days ago in England, where a man is asking me about good and bad and so on. I said a man has it in front of him, the good and the bad. He can choose good, he could choose bad. The man says, yes, but how do you choose? I know what the word choose means. So is anybody else who's listening to me, I hope. But what he wants me to do is say, yes, choose, that's a very big subject, and get confused when I try and explain it. I know what choose means. I have two things. I chose this or I chose that one. So don't be fooled by that tactic. If somebody has not made himself clear, point that out to him. But if you are making yourself clear, don't let somebody tell you that you're not, if you really are making yourself clear. In fact, I usually answer to questions like that. I just ask them, didn't you understand the word? You tell me what's difficult to understand about that word. Give him back the job he was hoping to give you. Now, there's different sorts of people that may challenge uh, the Muslim for taking the positions that he does. Some of them may be irreligious. They are people who, probably for good reason, don't like religion. They've been disappointed in what they have seen of religion. And so uh, the accusation might be that, uh, well, yours is just another religion. I've examined religions, and they are none of them any good. Yours is just another one. But you want to ask a man to make sure of that, to ask him exactly what is it you find in my religion that parallels other religions. Usually they'll tell you, but carelessly enough, they'll say, well, it's like all religions, it's built on superstition things that we know better then. It's something left over from primitive man before he uh, came into possession of knowledge. You want to challenge people on that to ask them, where is superstition in the Quran? Where is the unreasonable? There are those who might try to confuse that very issue on the religious side because they will tell you uh, that somehow what they have is not superstition and what you have is superstition. But again, ask for people to spell out the details. What is there that sounds like folklore, if you will, or mythology in the Quran? You have stories, rehearsals of historical events. What is there that sounds like the kinds of stories that people tell in mythology? There's a lot of that in the Bible. You find in the Psalms, in the book of Job, it tells you how did the world come to be? God had to fight with a dragon first. Rahab. That sounds like something out of mythology. There's nothing like that in Islam. We don't have battles between gods and goddesses and sons of gods and dragons and so on. And somehow when the insides of a dragon are ripped out, this became the earth and, the, and all these sorts of stories. That is superstition. That's not a part of the Quran. It sets out a sequence of events. 
stages by which the world came to be, but not according to a story that has these elements that uh, come out of mythology. It also should be noted that if people would accuse Islam of being somehow primitive or uh, it's not progressive, that they should take note of the educational method of the Quran. How does the Quran educate us? It does not do, as a lot of people are doing, for example, across the United States now, you have a great many churches who, they are so afraid of what the public school system will tell their children that they build their own schools and they put the children in there and they teach them only what they want them to hear. Anything that they don't like, that is eliminated. The books are censored or they don't even come into the school grounds. They teach them just what they wanted them to hear. Is that education? Is that how the Quran educates us? Well, not at all. The Quran quotes every silly thing anybody ever said. 332 times they say such and such. It doesn't shelter us from anything. The most outrageous and ridiculous things that people ever said, they're quoted for us in the Quran so that we can be shown the value of this. They say this, but do they know that? Have they forgotten such and such? That's how you really educate people. You show them everything. You don't hide something from them because you're afraid they're going to uh, go astray somehow. Show them everything, but put it in its place according to value. That's how education used to work. It doesn't work that way now even in the public school system. You get up into universities, in North America at least, and the idea is you put everything in front of somebody and you make no judgment on any of it. If you've got 10 ideas and somebody comes with idea number 11, put it alongside the rest of these. You do not grade anything. That leaves that to the student. Make up his own mind. In fact, he's encouraged not to make up his mind, just to remember, well, all of these are things people say. But real education, uh, even in the English, it, it has to do with leading out of things, is supposed to guide you through what is valuable. Make a note of this, it's not worth much. Well, throw it over here. This is good, keep it. Put it in this department or compartment. That's real education, and that's the Quranic method. Take the valuable, set aside those things that don't deserve your attention. In fact, we can use any educational program I often tell Muslims who worry a great deal about their children in public schools, it doesn't really matter which school they go to. All you have to do is ask them every day what they tell you in school today. Then ask them to think about it. How valuable was that? What do you make of it? Now, of course, on the other hand, as I've said, these are irreligious people may attack the Muslim position saying, you see, you people are primitive, you're superstitious or whatever. The religious who would oppose the Muslim uh, do the opposite. Uh, they would insist on a superstition. I say, what's wrong with you people is, you haven't carried over this. You've been too cold and calculating, and you've just stuck to bare facts. You have to realize religion involves this and this and so on. And they would heap on us the superstition. So it is that, in particular, the Quran makes some of these things clear, that they are nothing but superstition. It's a very firm pronouncement, over and over, the firm pronouncement uh, Allah does not adopt nor beget a son. He doesn't have offspring, however you want to view it. Adoption, begetting, whatever process you think it was, there's no such thing as a son of God in any real sense, according to the Quran. But that's not a command in the Quran. It doesn't command Muslims, believe that. It's an objection. It's a thing that's exhibited. It tells you why. Maybe we can come back to that, but it gives you reasons why it isn't so. It doesn't just demand that you not believe it. It doesn't rob you of a superstition. It identifies it as a superstition. Just recently in uh, Dublin, Ireland, uh, a priest stood up after a, a lecture I'd given there, and he started off by introducing himself, and he told everyone, he said, I'm an expert on Islam. He said, I've been studying Islam for many years. Only this afternoon I gave a lecture on Islam. And then he went on, to show how little he knew about it. 